Welcome to the Good Growing Podcast. I am Chris Enroth, Horticulture Educator with University of Illinois Extension, coming at you from Macomb, Illinois. And we have got a great show for you today, folks. We are going to be talking about fall cleanup. It is time to do that. Finally, it seems like. Um, so we have got our co-host with us every single week. We are joined by local food systems and small farms educator, Katie Parker and Quincy. Hey, Katie. Hey, Chris. How's it going? Yeah, just fantastically. Uh, we had our first frost last night. So that was, it's like, yay. It's November 2nd too, by the way, for right. people listening, it's kind of late for us, but um, yeah. How are, about, how are you doing, Katie? Things are going pretty well. It's a bit chillier today than uh, I had hoped, but it is what it is. Like Exactly. It is, it is a little chilly. It's soup weather. Um, and someone who I know is loving the weather and soup probably is horticulture educator Ken Johnson in Jacksonville. Hey, Ken. Hello, Chris and Katie. It's still shorts weather. <laughs> <laughs> Ken, I can see you shoveling snow in shorts in my head. So I, I have done that. Okay. Usually start off with shorts and a, a sweatshirt and then I know I'm getting so sweating so much the sweatshirt comes <laughs> off and it's t-shirt yeah. and shorts. <laughs> flip-flops and, and all that good stuff well i mean so we've had our first frost now last night which when we think about when this happens on average it's a little bit late for us and i guess i'll say i had my frost katie frosted in the adams county area correct yeah. yep and ken same with you yep yeah so it it feels like once this frost happens it sets about a chain of events in motion uh that it's like uh we have to do this now or else things die um katie did you get all of the plants inside last night i did not no oh. i was not prepared <laughs> uh so we still have some ferns outside which are, it's looking pretty wealthy this morning and then we have our fall pot fall pots out uh, which we had some coleus, some mums, um, like mountain grass in there. And then I had still had a couple of house plants outside, but luckily uh, it's on a covered porch. So they, they still looked okay this morning. Yeah, they're, they're probably good. I, um, yesterday I spent a lot of time moving plants uh, indoors. I don't have our lights and our plant racks set up yet. So they're on a big old blanket in the living room and <laughs> My wife is not happy about that, um, but the dog ate the remote, so it doesn't matter. You know? <laughs> that offsets issue of the plants, right? That's right. Now we can watch the plants instead of the TV. Uh, Ken, how about yourself? Did you get everything taken care of before last night's uh, frost? Yeah, as far as bringing stuff in, yeah, we brought we had stuff inside for a couple of weeks now. Once temperatures really started getting down to the fifties, because uh, we've got a lot of tropical stuff. That all came inside. I think the only thing we've got outside is some uh, is some lavender. Other than that, <clears throat> everything that we want to survive the winter is inside. Yeah, yes, you your Florida migrants that you brought up here, all the, <laughs> all those guys. Well, um, in terms of the the plants that we bring inside and outside over the the, the fall months, what about some of the herbaceous plants. And now herbaceous are plants that they grow green vegetative growth in the spring, summer, and then they die back down to the root system to the soil in the fall. Um, there was a, a comment made um, and it was a, it went out over email about cutting back your herbaceous uh, foliage for fall cleanup. Got a lot of kickback on that comment. Some people really adamant that that's not what you do. So Ken, can you explain a little bit what, why are people upset when um, it's suggested to trim up their perennial foliage? So I'll say well, a lot of this is all your perspective on, on how you approach gardening. So <laughs> traditionally, you know, it's been recommended to clean up your landscape um, in the fall, you know, cut back all the dead plant material. So you have this nice kind of clean, uniform look in your landscape. Um, nowadays, as, as people are getting a little more interested in kind of the more ecological, I guess, for lack of a better term, kind of landscaping, is leaving some of that plant material or all of that plant material stay in the landscape. Um, it can add some winter interest. You, know, you think about your seed heads, 
uh, so some different shapes and you know especially when we get snow on the ground can have some nice contrast there with um, that plant material or, or grasses you know especially some of the the native grasses that people are planting more and more have some color to them uh, those seed heads you leave behind like purple cone flower um, birds will come and eat feed on those seeds and stuff so you can draw, attract wildlife um, that way and also you have um, insects and stuff will overwinter on those pollinators and beneficials and pests will too so it's not just the good stuff that's going to overwinter on it you know, some some of them are prob uh, prob some prob uh, problematic insects can uh, <laughs> can stay on there too so you know by leaving that plant material behind <clears throat> if they're overwintering in um, like leaf litter you know those if you leave that dead plant material stand that'll kind of collect that leaf litter as it gets blown it'll kind of act as a wind break and catch that and they'll overwinter in that some of them some we think about some of our uh, butterflies um, at, when they're in their chrysalis, their pupil stage, they may pupate on that plant material itself. So if you're cutting that and removing it, and especially if you bag it up and, and take it off site, um, you're getting rid of all those butterflies in the spring and stuff. Um, so that's kind of the argument against not cleaning up is providing that habit, overwintering habitat, as well as some food resources. Um, and if you do clean up, you try to leave that plant material on your property if you're concerned about pollinators and stuff. So just put it in the backyard in an out of the way area um, and let it sit so that if there are any pollinators or anything like that on there, um, they can emerge in the spring. I, I guess I'm fortunate to have a spot in the yard where I can do stuff like that. I pulled out all my tomatoes last weekend and they just went in my little dump spot where I put all of my garden refuse. Um, and, but, but that makes me feel better. So if it is something that I want to trim up, I can just trim it, maybe pile it up in the planting bed. I just leave it for the winter and I'll take care of it in the spring. And I would say one exception to the not cleaning up is if you have disease issues, um, you want to clean, you kind of have to balance that. If you've got really bad disease issues, you probably want to do clean up. And again, this is going to depend on your tolerance for disease and what the plant is and stuff. Um, but for our yard, I, our, um, our bee balm, it gets powdery mildew real bad. So I usually do a fairly good job cleaning that up. So I don't have to worry about that infecting quite as quickly in the spring. Um, same thing with our peonies. We always get the leaf spots and measles on there. So I do usually do a pretty good job cleaning that up. Um, some people will leave out zinnias and stuff because birds will feed on the seed heads. In, in our yard, we get a lot of powdery mildew and we tend to plant them kind of in the same general area. So I usually do a pretty good job of, of cleaning those up. And again, they may go in the backyard kind of out of the way, but I don't let those stand just to kind of reduce some of that disease pressure for next year. So I like that. I mean, you're evaluating your yard on a location by location and a species by species basis. And yeah, you're trying to make it fit for having a nice looking yard, but maybe leaving a little bit for the, the insects out there too. Yes. And there's, there's no right answer. It all depends on, on what you're going for in your landscape. That's so right. don't get angry at me. <laughs> That's Oh no, the, we'll get angry emails for sure. It doesn't matter. It, it's great. But just uh, listeners, viewers, we try not to should all over you. Just want you to know that we, we don't want to do that. So we only give recommendations, the things that we might be doing. Uh, we're not telling you what to do. Um, so speaking of other things, maybe that might be controversial. Uh, Katie, I, I've swung by your house before. You have a beautiful yard. It's well taken care of. So what are you doing right now with all of the leaves? Because you have some trees around your house too. We actually haven't had many leaves drop yet. Um, we, ha we have two pin oaks, which hold on to mm. their leaves for, for what seems like forever. Yes. Um, and then we have um, a, a sugar maple and a red maple that haven't really started dropping their leaves yet. But when they do, uh, we do typically rake our leaves. Um, so we actually, we live around a park and it's actually kind of sad, but um, it seems like at the, at the furthest west of the park, there's one house. And so everybody's leaves <laughs> blow to that one house. And I always feel so bad because they just have mounds of leaves in their yard. Um, so I do try to keep on top of it. Uh, last year, our neighbor invested in uh, like a lawn sweep. Uh, mm -hmm. And so we use that on our lawn. And then we just pile them in our backyard uh, and put them on our garden. 
I can empathize. I live in a house on the western edge of the neighborhood, and we have a ranch house, so it's long, and it catches everything that blows across the street. Oh, yeah. Um, candy wrappers, leaves, you name it, it's it's shows up in our yard. So a lawn sweep, I'll have to look into another tool of my yeah. imaginary yeah. arsenal of toys, yes. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe we can make some, um, add it to our good growing tool, tool list that we share amongst each other. That's right. That's right. Ken's wood chipper, your core aerator and a, a lawn sweep too. Oh, that would there be you nice. Go. Now it, now, because I, I deal with so many leaves, like all of the time, um, I pretty much have to get a jump on it early in the season. So as Katie mentioned, and as we've also mentioned before, a late frost this year, leaves haven't really been dropping However, in my neck of the woods, ash, ash trees, they've been losing a lot of leaves um, and our sugar maples have turned and they are starting to drop. Um, but really I've been dealing with ash leaves and I think sycamore um, leaves right now. And so I, I do go through, I have a mulching mower and I just, I mulch them, but there will come a point when the maple start to turn, a lot of the other trees will turn and I have to rake them up and I have a as I mentioned I have a pile in my backyard that go is where all of the uh, plant material goes including leaves and so I actually have a bed that I have created I mulch it in fall leaves every year uh, some are shredded some are just raked up and put on a tarp and drug back there um, but I have a lot of other shrubbery in this bed that has uh, fruit and flowers for pollinators and birds and so that but I use leaves for my mulch in this particular spot. Um, I, but again, this is controversial. People say, don't rake your leaves. Ken, weigh in on this once more. Why should I not be raking my leaves? So the kind of the idea behind not raking to some extent, but kind of really the, the mulching or bagging them and taking them off site is again, you have those insects overwintering in those, uh, a lot of, um, uh, caterpillars or pupa, depending on the moth or butterfly, how they overwinter. Uh, the caterpillar and pupal stage, a lot of times they're overwintering in leaf litter um, or underneath leaf litter. So having that, again, is providing that habitat for them. So that's kind of the, the main reason. Um, I'll say for our yard, um, if it's on the lawn itself, we typically rake those and um, shred those with the chipper shredder. Um, but if it's in the flower beds and stuff, <clears throat> that stuff just stays there. Um, you know, we may rake some of the leaves kind of around those beds, rake those into there, but we do still shred those. We actually just used the last of our leaves from last year, this past weekend as mulch. So we mulch flower beds, we mulch our vegetable gardens um, with shredded leaves and stuff. So it's a lot cheaper than going out and, and buying mulch that way. Yeah, I, I, we're the same way. And, and again, if it's on the lawn, I want to get it off. Uh, it's not that I'm like um, just in love with the lawn, I just don't want to have to do anything to it. So <laughs> if uh, the leaves are going to smother the lawn and then I have to go buy seed and fertilizer and all that stuff to get it back going again, I don't want to have to do that. I'll get the leaves off that way the lawn, or actually it's mostly like creeping Charlie, clover, uh, a lot of dandelion. I have a lot of weeds and maybe I just don't want to smother my weeds. So I, I, I pile everything in the backyard or I, I mulch it up. Yeah, and a few leaves here and there on the lawn, you know, I think it's, you know, 20% 20, 20 of your lawn has leaves on it. That's not going to smother it unless it's really concentrated in one area. Mm -hmm. It's all going to blow to your western neighbor, <laughs> so you won't have to worry about it. But, that's right. yeah, if, it, if it's a light covering, you don't necessarily have to do anything. But if you've got heavy leaf cover, that's when they start, especially when they start matting together, you start getting stuff smothered. And I'm the same way. We have more weeds than we do grass in mm -hmm. our yard. Well, and too, yep. like with this year, since it's so late, like leaf drop is so late, I would hate to have like a smothered lawn with leaves and then we get a snow because that just, that just makes a mess. Yeah. Yeah. They just like stick to the mm -hmm. ground. Yeah. It creates layers. Mm -hmm. Now there was a winter, well, fall, a few, was it 2016, 2017? we were still mowing grass up to like the middle of December. So uh, it can, it, it can stay warmer, <laughs> you know? So we might be doing this for a while. Um, 
But I, I guess speaking of gardening, vegetable gardening, um, like I said, I pulled my tomatoes. By the way, my tomatoes were absolutely beautiful this year. I hardly had any disease issues. I don't know why. I don't know what I did different, but they did outstanding. Other than just having tons of white fly at one point in the year, but it didn't seem to slow them down. Um, uh, but I pulled them out. I pulled the peppers. Actually, I potted up my peppers and they're in the basement right now because um, I try to perennialize them. Um, uh, Ken, are you doing anything with your vegetable garden this year? Or you just you just let it go in the fall? We pulled our tomatoes in September. Oh, <laughs> we, we were done with that. And we, we put a cover crop down. So we pulled, we've got two okra plants and a couple of jalapeno plants, plants left other than that. Everything got pulled and we've got um, cover crop down in our garden. And I can, I can send you a picture so you can put that in there so everybody can see. What it looks oh yeah. Like. Well, I'll take pictures. I'll always take some pictures. That's, that would be great. Um, Katie, I, I know you grow in containers, right? If you have any veg, vegetables in your yard. We have a, a raised bed and then we, um, this year we planted some in the ground too. Oh, okay. Uh, but yeah, we pretty much did the same thing. We removed our tomatoes, peppers, um, and other plants, uh, definitely from the container garden. And then we removed some of the plants, um, too, from our in-ground. And then we spread a layer of compost over the garden. Um, and then we'll put some leaves over top and call it good. Uh, I had hoped to get a cover crop out, but it kind of got late uh, in the season. And so uh, I might try to do like a, a spring um, seeding of a cover crop to, to get that going too. I think we all do something a little bit different. It sounds like, so I have been using just wood chips uh, to, to, as kind of my mulch for overwinter in my garden beds. And Usually by midsummer, those wood chips are gone and I'm ready for a fresh amount uh, come, you know, mid to late summer of the next year. Do you find, do you have to apply any additional fertilizer with using wood chips? I haven't seen that yet. Now I do a slow release when I plant in the, in the, mostly it's in a planting hole, but some, if it's a furrow, I would just sprinkle it along in the, in the mm -hmm. row there like that. Um, but no, I just usually do a slow release. Um, I have okay garden soil where I'm at. Uh, it's the top soil. It's, you know, it's a developed residential area. So the top soil, which probably one time was like taller than me is now like this deep. And so it's, it's not that expansive. I dig down a little bit and I hit a clay pan. Um, but so I'm trying to use the smolts to maybe build up a little bit more organic matter if I can. Yep. Uh, I, I don't have to water hardly at all with the wood chips. That's also the thing that I like. Might be bad if I get disease problems, but you know. I know we've been passing around strawberries this last year. I've planted some strawberries. Katie, did you plant some strawberries? I planted the strawberries I got from Ken. Uh-huh, uh-huh. They're really taking over our raised bed. So Ken, what, what do we gotta do to get these things ready for next year? Or, or, or we just kind of wait and see? I can say for our strawberries, probably not the right thing. I don't do anything to them. Whatever happens, happens. I don't, I don't mulch them or, or anything. So, and so, so far, they haven't. They've made it through the winter. So, <laughs> this year may be the year that does me in, but <clears throat> we'll see. I think a lot of times people, when it starts, when it starts getting cold, um, they'll mulch them, and then you'd remove that in the spring once you start seeing some new growth um, and stuff on them. Usually people use straw, that's the strawberries. So the idea of mulching strawberries, is it to protect the, the crown of the plant? The crown, yeah. Yeah, so okay. it doesn't get damaged and stuff. And, and I've, we've got a pretty healthy um, leaf canopy on ours, so I'm sure that helps um, with that. This year, we, we did mow them off for the first time this year. And at this point, you can't even tell we mowed them. It's, it's crazy. And as an aside, this weekend, we started making some strawberry wine. Oh. The strawberries we grew. So that's oh, cool. Pod, we'll have to podcast at Ken's back. house. <laughs> <laughs> we, so we put the so we put the yeast in Sunday, and yesterday I came home from lunch, and it already started foaming out. 
Ah. Of the container. So yeah, we're doing something very right or very wrong. One of the two. <laughs> it's alive. <laughs> Maybe you just had like high sugar content. For they were they were very yeah. There, there's very a lot of sugar sweet. in them, and then we added you know according to the recipe we added yeah like nine cups or some some ridiculous amount of sugar or something like that or no so, it was nine cups it was nine pounds it was yeah it was like nine pounds of sugar because we had like a we've got like a five gallon uh-huh there's there's what 15 20 pounds of strawberries in there so, okay hang on we'll so see. you're a ton of sugar i don't know how fermenting works very well but so you put the sugar in as the food for the yeast and then the yeast byproduct is ethanol and co2 right so you're gonna have a lot of alcohol in this thing if <laughs> this is gonna be a potent strawberry wine so it's gonna like. be a dessert wine <laughs> yeah <laughs> i think it's, uh, at a certain point uh, the alcohol just gets too high on the yeast dies so mm. unless you've got special strains and even then it can only get so high it's rubbing it's, alcohol then. It's my <laughs> rudimentary understanding of <laughs> fermenting stuff. Well, I'm excited to try this and, and maybe have a phone on handy to dial 911 if we need. So <laughs> I'll do it in the parking lot of the hospital. <laughs> there you go. Uh, well, some one of the other things that I always do also is I prep my machinery for winter. Um, one of the things that I, I've I've learned now is to always have your machines ready to go in the winter because you think you're done, but then ice storms happen and suddenly you need to fire up a chainsaw. Um, I use, so we had a really bad ice storm last year. I actually used the mower with the wagon and everything to haul um, uh, down trees and lumber and stuff. Um, I actually attached the mower with the dog tether and I hauled like a 20 foot uh, tree trunk that was like, you know, you know, two foot wide. It was nuts. I was surprised I was actually able to do it. Um, ruined the dog tether though. But, um, but so some of the things to prepare for that, at least what I do is I actually put stabilizer in my fuel. I actually do that all year long um, just because I never know when the next cold round of weather was going to hit. Um, so, but that's what I'm doing. Stabilize, putting stabilizer in my fuel, making sure that um, I'm taking my blades off my mower and I'm sharpening those. Um, and then, uh, kind of one of the last things I do is I take all of my little hand tools and I clean them and I oil them, uh, last year, actually last spring, I sanded all my wooden handles and then I oiled them up. That was awesome. They looked brand new after I did that. So I recommend that too. So, uh, Katie, do you, uh, do anything special in terms of, uh, getting the ready for the, put the tools up for the winter time? Yeah, Matt usually um, will take care of like the lawnmower. Um, as for like tools, I usually try to make sure we clean any leftover dirt off of them um, because rust is real. Like it's crazy how much um, if you just leave some soil or something on it, uh, how much that can uh, have an effect on your tools in a, in a winter period. Um, other than that, I think we're just kind of like cleaning stuff up a little bit uh, so that way you know you can have tools easily accessible if you do need them. Ken you getting ready to fire up the chipper shredder all winter long? Yeah, we're good there I don't think we put any uh, fuel stabilizer in there so it may be an adventure oh. <laughs> getting that started. <laughs> yeah once the leaves start falling we'll we'll start shredding again and we get the stabilizer in the lawnmower and you can get that you know, blade sharpened and all that fun stuff and haven't cleaned up the shovels or anything yet because well, we were planting last weekend and we've got a bunch of bulbs coming that haven't because the shipping delays haven't we haven't gotten yes. them yet so we've got we have a bulb planting party one of these weekends still so i yeah. keep checking my email and it's like still hasn't shipped I'm like all yeah, right ours was, ours was supposed to ship mid-october Mm -hmm. so we finally emailed them like <laughs> did we miss them to porch pirates get them or something and i guess yeah it's just shipping delays for you know some of them are coming from over from europe like the tulips and stuff mm -hmm. and they just haven't gotten them yet so it's it's one tulip it's one tulip that says delayed on my invoice and it's like ah oh, <laughs> if i'd left that one tulip off i probably would have mine by now 
Yeah, because like in your, you know, you take pictures with your phone and you know, memories mm-hmm. pop up. And we were we were all done planting at this point last year. We were planting and <clears throat> like third week of October, we'd got everything planted by then. And oh my goodness. We haven't started started our bulbs yet this year. So no, no. Garlic hasn't gone in the ground for us either. Um we're I still have it next to me from our talk um, with Nick. It's still sitting here, um, but I think it's going to go in the ground this coming weekend. We're going to get it planted. So at least that will be going in the ground. So we got ours in. It was the last week and two weekends ago. Got it in, but unfortunately a couple of the, the bulbs were bad. So mm. we didn't, we didn't get as much planted as we'd wanted to. Yeah. We'll see how these stack up. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. And it was we did um, have we did have music for our girls. Good music. Year, so. in, in terms of other items, I mean, Ken, we were talking about this earlier. You have dahlias and things like that that typically need a frost before you can pull those out of the ground. I have elephant ear that I'm just like, come on, frost, so I can get you out of here. Come and then. Um, Weren't you saying, because tonight we're supposed to like really get really cold and that could kill the plants then. So uh, what, are we, yeah. what should we do in tonight? Yeah, a lot of times just wait till you get a frost. So that kills off the top growth and you cut that off and bring it in and, and get ready to overwinter it. But you don't want to leave it out for a hard frost. So mm-hmm. we have one day, <laughs> unfortunately yes. one day this year to get that all done. So yeah, when I get home, I'm going to be digging dahlias. At least <clears throat> I've cut the tops off, get them inside um tonight and then i can worry about getting them into peat moss or we use we're, we're going to use peat moss um because this year we actually we built some raised beds and put them in raised beds mm-hmm. normally we had them in um pots and we just cut the tops off and bring the whole pot inside and just overwinter them in the pots but it can be a little more work this year <laughs> involved with getting those in so and dahlias um gladiolus some of them can take a little more cold than others but most of them are probably because we're getting down at least in jacksonville i think the upper 20s mid 20s mm-hmm. potentially the next couple of nights need to get in so we don't get damage on them all right well now i'm panicking i need to go home right now and get this done <laughs> oh my goodness well what other tips do we have to to give to folks um you know if, if people are dealing with other items that need to be winterized the one thing uh, get your hoses unhooked and and drained with water so you're not getting those all messed up um so we did that i did unhooked ours on sunday and i'm working most of the water is drained out but i'm just kind of draping it over the the deck railing just mm-hmm. kind of get the last of it out and then we'll wind that up and put that away for the winter I'm, I'm taking all of the hard plastic fittings off of the irrigation system, our drip irrigation system. I found the more flexible stuff can tolerate the freeze thaw of water, but the hard plastic fittings, even times that I have um, uh, kind of blown out the lines, it's a little bit of water just sitting on the bottom of that plastic fitting and just, just cracks right there. Uh, that fitting, I'm like, ah. You gotta you you don't notice until next spring when you go to turn it on. So, yeah, I take all the hard plastic fittings off uh, even after blowing out the lines, just because it doesn't. It just still seems to crack. It seems like. Yeah, I realized last night I need to empty out our rain barrel, uh, which is full of water. I usually try to like save some of that for watering house plants during the year because we have a water softener, um, but. So I need to get that accomplished tonight, I guess. And then in terms of like pesticides, I know a lot of folks store those out in like a garden shed or in the garage. Um, what are we supposed to do with those? Yeah, you typically want to keep them in a, a cool, dry place. Um, so you don't want them to, to freeze or anything. So if you don't have an insulated garage, that might be a little too cold for them so if you can put them in your basement or somewhere where it's not going to get too warm um but not too cold and then also you want to make sure that you're keeping them out of um out of place where your kids or um animals or anybody can get into it because that could 
cause some bad things. And we used to do, um, we have a little backpack sprayer. Our garage is insulated now. Uh, but when with my parents, I usually uh, winterize theirs. Uh, so just clean it out, make sure that um, that there's nothing in the lines or anything. And then uh, they keep theirs in an in, on insulated shed where they keep like cold storage for equipment. So we'll usually put some antifreeze in it to keep it from uh, freezing up or anything. Yeah, so I remember the there's liquid that can also pool at the bottom of a backpack sprayer and it can mm -hmm. freeze. And I've done that before. You put your pest or it was herbicide in there, and suddenly I felt a trickle down my back as where that spot had frozen the winter before. Uh, I then had pesticide <laughs> all over my butt. So yeah, just clean those sprayers out. <laughs> and I would say check your labels on your pesticides. Um, cause I'll give you ranges of, of temperatures and stuff, but yeah, like Katie said, in general rule of thumb, don't let them freeze. Don't let them get too warm. So a lot of times we're restoring them probably isn't the best garage probably is not the best place or a shed in general, but that's where most of us end up putting them. I have a spot in the basement inside for paint and pesticides. Um, it's probably something else that's supposed to go there too. Like all of the other glues and sealants and caulkings and all that stuff. I keep that all. I have a, a, a cabinet in the basement I can I can keep the kids out of. So, well, my goodness, guys, we have a lot of work ahead of ourselves. Uh, it seems like in the next well less than twelve hours before we get that hard freeze. So, I guess we better call this an episode. Um, it was we covered a lot of great information. So, thank you both for for sitting around and, and chatting with me today. Appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Thanks for making my to do list grow. But it's always a pleasure to talk with you guys. Yes. Thank you both. Let's go get some work done and, and do this again next week. Oh, we shall do this again next week. We are going to be welcoming our oh, often recurring guest, Andrew Holsinger. Um, and we have some news. We have a project in the works. Uh, if you like our webinars that we've done in the past, we are have another uh, a, a couple in the bank here that we're going to roll out this winter. So uh, we are looking forward to uh, telling everyone about that next week. Uh, so listeners, thank you for doing what you do best, and that is listening, or if you're watching us on YouTube, watching, and as always, keep on growing.